Hello and welcome to this pit stop for Hunt for the Ring, a two to five player Lord of the Rings themed game designed by Marco Maggi, Gabriele Mari and Francesco Nipitello and published by Ares Games. In Hunt for the Ring, one player is going to take the role of Frodo or Gandalf, depending upon which part you're playing. And this is a pit stop for just the part one rules. We'll cover part two in another video, which will be available very shortly. In part one, Frodo is attempting to get from one of the three start spaces in the Shire across to one of the three end spaces in Breland. Now the Frodo player is never represented on the board by any of these figures. That's in fact a turn marker over there of sorts. What they are represented by is they're gonna be writing down numbers and dots in this screen hidden from the Nazgul player to represent where Frodo currently is on the board or what part of the wilderness he's currently traveling through. And that's the first thing that's gonna happen each turn is that Frodo's gonna note down either a dot to suggest that they're moving somewhere or a number to say where they've got to. Now when they've written a dot, they are considered to be in the location of the last number they have written down. If there's three movements per day, if Frodo chooses to move at night time, that's going to give the Nazgul a little bonus. So after Frodo's decided to move, the Nazgul players can each move one of the Nazgul once. And then they get a free action, and that action is a search. If they're on a numbered space, they can say to the Frodo player, are you or have you ever been in this space? And if Frodo says yes, they get to put a tracker there to show them that that is part of the trail that Frodo was on, but they don't know if he's there at the moment. Now that free search action happens at the end of every single turn. However, Frodo's got the option to move at night time if he thinks he's in a pickle, but that upgrades the free action that the Nazgul gets and they then get a hunt action. For a hunt action, they get to say to Frodo, are you currently in the numbered space that I'm in? And if Frodo says yes, let's put it, this now becomes a hunt symbol and the Nazgul are gonna corrupt Frodo, and that's how Frodo is gonna lose the game. He's gonna move down this corruption track, and if he ever hits 12 at any point, even at the very end, then Frodo is lost, and we won't even go on to part two of the game. Frodo's got 16 moves to get to Bree, and he's gonna get a load of corruption if he doesn't get there in time, so it's very much a race. Now, during this encounter in which we've had a hunt, we see how many Nazgul are adjacent to here, and Frodo pulls out corruption tiles equal to that number, and his corruption goes up by that amount. Now, usually they've got numbers on them. However, there are also Eye of Sauron ones. For each Eye of Sauron one that you pull, you add corruption equal to the number of tiles that are now, in this case, for the second one, we're gonna get two and throw those up on six corruption. Now, while the search and the hunt actions can be free for the Nazgul, they also have this pool of dice they roll at the beginning of each day, and they can take actions using them, but there are only six dice, and they're gonna be 12 Nazgul actions, so they have to ration them out. So they can use a sword die face result, and that will do exactly the same as we just said, the free nighttime action, and cause them to be able to hunt if they think they know where Frodo is, and cause him some corruption. There's also a ring result where they can do a perception check, and they can check whether a Frodo is in any of the thirds of the board, or more specifically, in a particular area. For example, here, Frodo, are you in 2C? And they can use a, a tracker to note that, that currently Frodo is in there. The last action that the Nazgul can do are these sorcery results, and that's gonna allow them to draw or play sorcery cards, and that's how they're gonna bend the rules to some degree. For example, they can get the Lord of the Nazgul into play, swapping out a normal one and putting them in there, and they get to add a fancy new die to their pool, which gives them extra movement or makes their usual action slightly more powerful. They might play the Fear of the Barrow Whites, and that will count as an extra eye token any time that Frodo subsequently draws any eyes during the corruption phase. Their power is terror, or somewhere in their clutch will allow them to do slightly more powerful search actions for Frodo or force them to reveal information. If the nine were abroad, what that does is it forces Frodo to discard some of his fellowship tokens. Now, fellowship tokens are over here, and Frodo gets to draw them at the beginning of every turn. And the reason he's going to do that is because while the Nazgul have these sorcery cards, Frodo's got these company cards to help him out, and also a deck of ally cards he gets to draw from and play to help him 
the game, break some of the rules of the game. For example, when a conspiracy is unmasked, Frodo can put Mary Brandebock in, into his company, and this is as big as it will get in part one. And each of these characters has got an ongoing small power. For example, if you rest at night, rather than taking that risky move, Sam will allow you to reduce your corruption by one, or Peregrine lets you draw more of these ally cards and Mary lets you play more. However, they've also got a one-off power in which you can flip them over, you no longer get their small power, but they will allow you to ignore one of these corruption tiles that you have drawn. There's also lots of could it be Gandalf cards that you can play, and that will be on Nazgul's turn, and it will usually cancel the effects of one of their actions. So you can do it as a bluff or to prevent them from getting more information of where you are. You can reduce corruption again. The road goes ever on via the use of cards. You can put a block in place with fear, fire, foes until the Nazgul is a certain space they can't move through. But most often these ally cards are gonna bring allies into play, like Fatty Bolger or Farmer Maggot or Goldbury, and there are many others, some named and some not. They will come into play according to the card on specific ally spaces on the board. And ally spaces are all easy to denote because they've all got names on them. Now these ally spaces are a double-edged sword because Nazgul cannot move through any space where there's an ally and some of them cause area effects to take place and aid you to slip away. But for each of the 12 ally spaces on the board, there are tokens and Frodo must draw five at the beginning of the game and give one immediately to the Nazgul. And that means the Nazgul are slightly more powerful. In this case, they can discard any die to move one additional step. During the course of the game, the Nazgul will not know which four Frodo has of the remaining 11 spaces face up behind his screen, but they can go to these ally spaces, perform searches, and if there is one that is behind the screen, they get to take that information token and put it down here, and then that makes their actions more powerful, it gives them more flexible use of their dice. In order to counteract that, Frodo can go to the ally spaces that he's got secretly and he just has to go there any time during the game and that will flip over these tokens and make them no longer available to the Nazgul but the Nazgul won't know that. However, it does distract Frodo away from the time critical job he's got of getting to Bree because when you get through 16 moves, if Frodo hasn't made it all the way to Bree or hasn't had 12 corruption, you then count the shortest distance, the shortest number of moves Frodo has to make to get to Chetwood Bree or down here to Unnamed Field. And then he draws that many corruption tokens. And again, if at that point, in the very end, if he gets to 12 or more, that is the end of the game and we'll not even go on to part two. If that doesn't happen, we do move on in which the Fellowship player is no longer going to be representing Frodo, but... Gandalf, who's going to be looking to fight off the Nazgul and keep Frodo safe, but we're going to keep those rules for another video at another time. This has been a pit stop for part one for Hunt for the Ring. For more videos like this, please check out the Game Pit channel on YouTube. For more in-depth coverage of games, please find the Game Pit podcast. Thank you.